Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast, episode number 83, Sebastian Fortier, One Hockey, Hockey Journey, presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pedlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we load up the car, make our way to the next One Hockey Tournament destination and begin this conversation, if you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, that I have the world's largest database of off-ice stick handling, passing, and hockey shooting drills, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com to gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon, and you want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's SweetHockeyCoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. Sebastian Fortier is my next guest, and like all that appeared on this show prior to him, has a hockey journey that is pretty amazing, and I can't wait to dive in. But before we do, let me tell you a little bit about Mr. Fortier. This French-Canadian grew up playing youth hockey in Greenfield Park, Quebec, before climbing his way up the hockey ladder, making it to the top, the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League, also known as the Q. After three years of junior hockey, he turned pro in 1993 and went on to play eight seasons professionally with ten different organizations. After retiring, Sebastian coached for a bit, ran a hockey school, but deep down, the way he thought he could make the biggest contribution to the hockey world was by organizing and running hockey tournaments around the globe. Since its inception in 2003, One Hockey is regarded as the premier hockey tournament experience provider worldwide, and Mr. Fortier is the captain of that ship. You'll learn how he might have been secretly groomed or inspired to be dominant in the youth hockey tournament sector, by watching his father, for over a decade, work on his craft up in Sherbrooke, Quebec. It's been a number of years since our paths have crossed, and I'm excited to reconnect with a guy that had a vision, started, and just never went away. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Sebastian Fortier to the show. Mr. Fortier, welcome to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Hey Lance, how are you? Thanks for having me. Yes, it's been uh, it's been a number of years since our paths have crossed. Uh, at one point, we were in the hard goods business. I had a company called uh, Sweet Hockey, and then Sniper's Edge Hockey, and you had a product called the the Fly Puck. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but uh, I'm glad to to see your face. You're actually here in Minnesota right now, aren't you? Yeah, I'm in Blaine right now. I'm at the Super Rink sending up for an event this weekend. Uh, I think we have 80 teams here. And uh, what's exciting is we have girls this weekend, and we're, we partner with the Minnesota Wild <clears throat> for the girls tournament. Uh, so we're partnering with the Wild, like I said, and really the purpose of the girls tournament is to grow girls hockey. So we have, uh, we have a, a girls day on Monday where the girls can come in, get some gifts, be part of some raffles, skate for free, get uh, get some skates and get out there. And hopefully we can get uh, we can have girls start to play hockey in Minnesota, uh, either here at the Super Rink or uh, anywhere, really, and, and grow, grow girls hockey. So it's our first time doing this for the Wild. But, but this is our – I think this is our 11th or 12th year here at the Super Rink. Uh, we went on a, on a, on a stretch for – seven or eight years with about a hundred teams a year. <clears throat> and then we lost our ice uh, for different reasons. We couldn't get the ice. We got the ice back last year. We brought, we brought 30 teams here, but this year we had enough time to promote. So we're back at 80 teams plus. <clears throat> Fantastic. Uh, we're going to get to one hockey and I like to call it your baby uh, in a little bit. Uh, can you do me a favor though? Can you just, move your phone or whatever you're using uh, away from you just a little bit because 
I'm going to see if the quality, you're really grainy Wait. on, uh, yeah, just move it away just a little bit, okay. see if that would uh, increase the quality. I don't know. You just, you're just so good looking. Part. You're so good looking at this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, before we get to uh, what you're doing today, what your real passion is, uh, I'd like to hit pause because there was a point in time uh, in your life when you were an aspiring hockey hopeful, a uh, really good hockey player, dreaming one day to play in the NHL. Uh, tell our listeners about your beginnings. Where did you grow up? Uh, your parents, other siblings, friends, your introduction to hockey and other sports. Basically, what it was like growing up, Sebastian Fortier. I was uh, I was born near near Montreal, actually, a place called Greenfield Park. It's kind of an English name, uh, you know, in the French province. Uh, but we quickly moved to Sherbrooke, Quebec, uh, where the Sherwood stick Sherwood sticks are manufactured in Sherbrooke. So hockey players know Sherwood sticks, especially yeah. the older ones. This is where the sticks were made. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, my dad was a, my dad was a mailman. My mom didn't work. Uh, my dad was a was a pretty pretty good hockey brain. He knew the game well. And he put me in the sport uh, when I was young. I mean, like here, like Minnesota people, I'd start skating when I was four or so, four or five. Uh, and I loved the sport. So I just, I, just kept, I just kept playing. And my dad said, hey, if you want to play hockey, I said, I want to play in the NHL. He says, mm -hmm. well, you can, but you're going to have to work hard, really hard. So, you know, from nine years old or eight, nine years old, I mean, I remember – uh, playing squirt, uh, double B or double C or squirt A like here. Yeah, uh, yeah. I tell this story all the time. Uh, I had the goalie dad. The goalie dad came to me and said, hey, Sebastian, you know, like, we know you're a good player and we love you, but can you not slap shot against my son in the warm-up because he's, you're hurting his hand? <laughs> and uh, And I said, okay, I'll stop, you know, and – so the reason I had such a good shot is my dad bought me a steel. You know, now they make those steel pucks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know how much it weighs. It, it probably weighed one pound. Uh, so, and I had a basement that was just not not finished. And so I would go down the basement and try to shoot the puck on, on, the, on, the, on the cement floor and on the cement wall. And it was all cement. And I was like, Dad, I can't, I can't even – barely moved the puck like I, I can't how am I going to be able to shoot it he said just just try just just keep trying <laughs> just, just keep doing. and he would just go like two feet then three feet and then all of yeah. a sudden I, I was able to, sh to to get some speed to it and then eventually of course it, it went up like two three four inches and I was able to lift it so imagine going back on the ice with a regular like six ounce puck so my shot was just unbelievable um uh, yeah. And then, you know, every, you know, in the winter, it's like here, there's not as many lakes as Minnesota, which I love Minnesota. I love, I've been coming here for so long. I have a lot of friends yeah. here, uh, but there was no lakes, but there was outdoor, outdoor rinks. Yeah. So once again, these parents were asking my dad, why is your son so good? He says, well, every day after school, when we don't have a practice. He's finished. His own works are done. He's, he's going to the rink. I'm dropping him off at four o'clock. And he walks home sometimes at nine or eight yeah. thirty, and he plays with guys. He plays with adults. I mean, I wouldn't even touch the puck sometimes, yeah. you know, when I was like seven, eight. But I, I, I try to. I mean, I would follow, and sometimes I'd get the puck, and eventually I would get the puck and make some moves. And but I just, I was on the ice all the time, so that really helped my, you know, my my the young age. I was, I was one, of the, I was the best player in my hometown. Right, and isn't it uh, isn't it interesting how that formula is? You can backtrack it to any hockey player that have had that's had any small amount of success. Mm -hmm. They did they did more than everyone yeah. else, you know. In addition to their team practices and to. games, you have to, you have to. So yeah, I mean, I didn't even play, I didn't even play in the NHL. Uh, you know, I had a contract and. To continue, like I, I played and I, I was the best player in my in my city. And back then there was no summer hockey. And my dad, when I was peewee, 
uh, or 12 you now they call it, uh, he's like, hey, you got to play in the summer. You know, if you don't play in the summer, you're falling behind these guys from U.S. and Toronto and Ontario. They're playing all summer. So he start putting together some summer teams, or a summer team, my team. Yeah. And the kids were older than me. I was younger, but I was able to go on the team because it was my dad. I was the worst player in the team, but I was on the team and I was playing you know, all summer. Uh, so that, that, you know, got, that got me the edge to you know, eventually I was bad in double A uh, and uh, I didn't make the triple A team, midget team, which was hard to make at Bantam. It's really, you know, players that are very, you know, Martin St. Louis, the Canadians coach, he, he played uh, 16 triple A at 14, but yeah. it's just hard because you're, you're like, you're, you're younger than the other guys, of course. It's like playing juniors at 16. It's it's tough. Yeah. Uh, but I got called back. I got called up in the Triple Imaged League after Christmas. We had a cr- tournament in my hometown, which my dad was running. And, and then I moved to Triple Imaged. Then I ended up playing in juniors. I was ranked number six junior draft the morning of the draft. So the, the major junior draft, I was sixth. Uh, you know, wow. uh, number two or three was Rene Corbett, played for yeah. the Avalanche. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Martin Lapointe. Lapointe, he wasn't bet. even eligible at the draft. Uh, but there was some. It was Philip Boucher. You know, sure. Philip yeah. Boucher was number one pick. So those were the guys that I was there with uh, at that time. But you know, you know, my career. I mean, I. It's easy to blame on the coaches, but I just didn't get coaches that liked my style because I was very physical. I was able to play. But I was able to play physical as well, and it's, it's hard for coaches to understand that. Hey, I can I can make the hits, and I can go I can go nail someone behind the and again and score. You know, I can do both. But a lot of these coaches are like, "Hey, this guy's a physical player. We'll put him on the third line. He's he's a grinder." But I was able to play. So eventually, I went to Montreal. I didn't get drafted. Supposed to be drafted. I wasn't sure. I didn't get a lot of ice time in juniors. I guess. I uh, should have got more, but I didn't. And I didn't get drafted, but Montreal invited me to the camp as a free agent, and I signed with them. My first exhibition game, I uh, got in a fight. I remember the coach before the game. That's a funny story. I got a lot of stories, <laughs> but uh, this one is funny. Uh, the, uh, before the game, the coach was saying, like, I was I was with Montreal farm team against English. I didn't speak a word in English, so I didn't understand what he said. But he was saying... <laughs> Number 68, number 68 is a big goon. He's just here to fight. They want to play tough against us. Like, just don't even worry about him. But I don't know what he's talking about. So I halfway through the game, I went and dropped his glove. I dropped my glove. I got the first punch. Uh, so I, I cut him. And then when I punched him, shoulder dislocated. So, oh. so my shoulder was out. So I fell on the ice. And then I was done. Uh, and then Jacques Lemaire, you know Jacques Lemaire? Yeah, yeah. He, he coached the Wild. Uh, I'm sure many people in Minnesota know Jacques Lemaire. Sure. Like me. And so he came down the locker room. My dad was there. And so he's like, hey, listen, I'm going to talk to Sir Chavar about you tomorrow and see what we want to do with you. Because we were going to play – they were going to play me seven games. Eight games. So – but I only can play half a game. Okay. I said, we're going to sign you. We don't want to lose you. We're going to keep you. So they gave me the basic basic contract, the minimum. Uh, but, hey, I was 17 or 18. I got a bonus check, you know, $20,000 bonus. I bought a car, a little car, a used car. But uh, it was my, you know, it was my only NHL contract. But uh, it was pretty – I'll never forget that day. Yeah, I mean, that's the the team. That if you're going to get a contract with, that's who you want to be with, isn't it, Montreal? If you're from Quebec? Wow, yeah, exactly. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's fantastic. So you ended up, uh, you know, you must have enjoyed it a little bit because you, you played for for eight years uh, professionally. Uh, you bounced around quite yeah. a bit. You, I think you had 10 organizations in, in eight years. So uh, talk about the pro experience yeah. and – um, you know, was it injuries? Was it well, my uh, my my first year? I mean, I have 
and I have a, you know, I tell that story to people all the time. My first year, I just, uh, I, I was supposed to stay in an American League team in Fredericton. I should have stayed there. And they had a kid, you know, he was older than me. I was 19, but this, this player was 23. He came from college, or 24, and his brother was 19 like me. And they wanted the both brothers to stay together. So they wanted the older brother to stay with the younger brother. And the younger brother was a big prospect, more than me. So they decided to keep the older brother and took my spot. And I, and, uh, I never forget. Like I got there and I went with Marky Matthew, which ended up playing for the Boston Bruins for a few years. And he played in the NHL. We both were sent down to the, to the East Coast League in Wheeling, West Virginia. So this guy picks us up at the airport, this big, big guy, like, you know, overweight guy and just the, the mustache, like a couple of twists in there and big <laughs> belt buckle and jeans. So I'm like, I told, I told Marky, I'm like, well, this, this must be the team, like, Aaron, you know, Aaron boy. Like, he's just, he's just <laughs> picking us up. You know? Next thing you know. Next thing you know, I didn't speak English. Marky spoke English. So the guy talked to us, and I didn't understand the word he said. But Marky's like, hey, it's our, it's our coach. It's not the Aaron coach. boy. It's our coach. <laughs> I, said, I said, are you joking? <laughs> no, it's not our coach. So we go in the hotel, drop us off. The next morning, you know, we just came back from the American Hockey League, you know, and the, the Montreal Canadiens camp, like NHL. So it's our third camp in like a month. Uh, go in the locker room. It's cold. There's no carpet on the floor. We used to be like treated like kings in Fredericton and Montreal. Like the, you know, the fruits and the veg, the, the, the the juice, and then there's no, there's barely any water in there. It's like we're freezing our butts and like Marky, like can you tell the trainer to turn the heat on. I'm freezing in here. There's no <laughs> carpet. It's just I'm like, where's our sticks? He's like, I don't know. We have to go pick. You know, we gotta pick a stick in there. Anyway, it was really bad. So, uh, and the coach hated my gut. He just did not like me for uh, whatever reason. Uh, it's funny because before going to the East Coast League, you know, and when I was triple A midget and Banton double A, I'd score a lot of goals. I was always the first scorer. And, and then when I started playing juniors, I kind of stopped scoring a bit because I was physical and I just forgot to score almost. I just kind of focused on the physical play. And just moving the puck, not scoring. So my dad was upset that I went to the East Coast League. He says, can you do me a favor? Can you just score some goals like you used to? Yeah. Please score some goals. So I did. In like three exhibition games, I have like 14 points. We're in the first line. Me, Marky, and this Russian kid that came. His name was Vadim uh, Twetchenko, I think. He was really good. He was like, didn't speak English at all. We were playing together. We didn't speak, but we, we played well. And then the first game of the year, I have a goal. Second game of the year, I remember we're going to road, and there were like a bunch of fights. I got a little timid, you know. It was I was 19. These guys are like 26, 28, 30, like big fights, and they were not junior fights; they were pro professional yeah. fights. And I was a little scared, to be honest. And I had a couple bad shifts. Got hit from behind, broke a tooth. Now I have two teeth. The- <laughs> But that was my first one. I go back on the bench. I'm like, hey, coach, look, I broke a tooth. He says, he, he told me things that I can't say live because, you know, you would, you would be back on the, the internet with your show. But it was not pretty. We go in the locker room. He's all over. It was nuts. And after that period, I was on the first power play, first penalty kill. I never touched a power play or the penalty kill the rest of the season. And this was the second game of the season. Wow. So he completely, completely, he wanted me to fight. And I mean, I fought in juniors like 15, 20 times. So there's no big deal. But it's almost like I was, I hated him so much. I said, you're not going to win that battle with me. I'm not fighting wow. for you. So we got to the playoff. They cut me from the roster. He said, you're not good enough for us. So I called my agent. And I call myself up in the American League. So I get there. These guys are not in the playoff, right? So they have nothing to lose. I like call the guys, tell them, you know, tell them I'm not going home. It's March 1st. I'm going yeah. to the American League. Get me up there. Call somebody. So he did. <laughs> first game, 
First game, I get uh, I get an assist, a fight, 15 no hits. Holy. I was killing people. After the game, I was taking my stuff off. I swear to God, I had a line of eight people in line to come and shake my hand. And to tell me how great I'm doing and how much I've improved all year. And they were like, oh, they, they should have called you back earlier. We got, we're glad they called you up. I said, I said, they didn't call me up. They cut me. I called myself up. <laughs> <laughs> I told the truth. That's so I played four. How did uh, you get yeah, in? Yeah, it's, it, it's crazy. I mean, it's two stories. So I was really meant to to do what I do now with the kids and run hockey tournaments, and we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, ended up playing four games, three assists, two fights. I think twenty minutes uh, penalty minutes or so, fifteen hits a game every game. Uh, I was hitting like a bulldozer, and then and we got to the the meeting after the season, and the coach and manager are like, I don't understand, Sebastian. Your coach told us you're you were you were not a good player. You, you told us you were his worst player, and told us you pretty much were horrible. I said, I said, I told you the coach, the coach hates me. His goal is to ruin my life. It's his only goal in life. And he, the players that I talked to, the co- they played on them. He's he done the same thing with them too. Three of them I met. Same thing. Wow. Anyway, so Montreal Canadiens say, hey, we have to stick with our coach. We're going to buy your contract out. So we're going to let you go. I said, you can buy my contract out if you want. But don't tell me that this is your coach because it's not your coach. You would never pick him as a coach. The guy looks like a garbage, the, the, the pickup, uh, the, the delivery. Uh, yeah, garbage. What he looks like, but it's just, it's just ridiculous. I said, you, if you pick that guy as a coach, you guys will get sued by everybody else in the, in the NHL. Like, it's impossible. You just had to get a farm team in the East Coast League. You pick that team because it's not too far. And the guy is the coach, and so you're stuck with him. But don't tell me it's yeah. your coach. They said, okay, you're right, it's not our coach. So they bought me out, and then I just – I kept playing in the East Coast, East Coast League, a few teams. Eventually, I ended up playing in Phoenix, Arizona, and I loved it there because was, the weather was awesome. And when I retired, I'm like, I'm not going back to Quebec. So I got married in Arizona. Uh, you know, I needed to get married to stay in the U.S. because I'm Canadian. And I did that, that and eventually moved to California. Now I've been to California for 20 – Three years. Yeah. And since we're doing this podcast, I I can invite myself out to say hi to you at some point. Just just yeah. saying. <laughs> Obviously. Yes, for sure. Do some golf. So um well, congratulations. I mean it, it wasn't the the career that you dreamt of as a kid, but you definitely got to, to travel that road and uh, put together a career uh, and you were someone that didn't give up and you, you, you played on your terms, you ended on your terms. So congratulations yep. on that. Thank you. So I, the first time that we met, and I just want to touch briefly on this, was I had a hard goods company called, uh, it's now uh, Sniper's Edge Hockey, so I have a bunch of training aids and stuff. And I met you at a number of trade shows uh, here in Minnesota, up in Canada. Um, and you had, you had, you've developed a, a product called the Fly Puck. Uh, so tell me a little bit of, you know, tell our listeners a little bit about that. It's an off-ice puck, I know. Um, and, you know, yeah. it went away and now oh, it yeah. might be back. Yeah, we might bring it back. Uh, so Green Green Biscuit uh, pretty much took the same concept and designed Green Biscuit, and it's a great puck, and they've done, they've done a great job. Uh, but basically, I, uh, before I started One Hockey, I was doing tra- hockey schools across the U.S. So I had schools in eight, nine states, including Minnesota. Uh, in I think it was in Burnsville, that yep, I did yep. my hockey school. Yep. I think. Anyways. Uh, so uh, we, we would go outside and do stick handling with golf balls. One day I'm like, I need to get a, you know, I'm, I'm just sick of using balls. Like We play with a puck, we don't play with a ball. So I went to a roller hockey store and I bought every roller hockey puck they had. And then I tried them all up. 
and the, 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 the two that work good on the asphalt or better, I kind of work on the design a little bit. And I had a guy that could, that could do that with me, of course, because I can't draw or anything. I'm not, a, you know, a design guy. Like I, I can type pretty fast, but I can't, I can't draw nothing. I mean, you should see me draw a dog. It's, it's it looks like a, <laughs> yeah. it's bad. You're an idea guy. Yeah. Uh, so eventually we designed the fly puck uh, and then puck came and I'm like, okay, well, I got like 5,000 pucks. Now what do I do? I got to sell them. How do I sell them? So I wow. start calling, I start calling uh, retailers all across the U S first and try to get, I try to talk with the guy in charge and try to, nobody would talk to me. So then I changed my pitch. I said, uh, I said, Hey, who's the guy in charge here? I said, uh, no, I would say, I would say, Hey, Sebastian with Montreal Canadians. You know, I kind of did. I was with the contract with him. So I, I yeah. was, I was, I was in line completely, but that was my way in. And, <laughs> and then I, no I, I, I talked, yeah, yeah. I talked to the guy. Either play against sports or, I mean, that's so. I would say, listen, I invented a puck that slides on the street like a puck on the ice. I know you don't believe me. Nobody does. You're not the only one. Here's the deal. I the puck now is in about a hundred store, and but you know, I'd say the hundred to get them interested. Uh. Because it should have been in a hundred stores, but I was just starting, right? You can't. Nobody wants to be the first to buy. They all want to follow each other, right? That's the sales one hundred and one. Yeah. If people are, if most people are followers. Uh, so I said, hey, listen, I'm going to ship you a case of puck. You know, it doesn't cost you anything. I have your address here. Let me sure it's the right address. When you get the pucks, there's fifty pucks in the box. Open the box, take a puck, take it outside in the street, and try it out. Stick handle. See if you like it. It's just terrible. Like, make sure the street is decent. Like, not yeah. like million rocks and holes, and just make sure it's a decent surface. And uh, then start selling them. Fifteen bucks a puck. There's an invoice in the box. Sixty days. Send us a check, and then we'll send you more. I got in over five hundred stores like that. Holy cow! Store, store by store. Yeah, this... I did some crazy things. Yeah. That's an amazing story, Grant. I mean, you're just working on your process, and it's you're not going to get all of them in one week, but you get no. one this week, two yeah. next week, and after. Well, the I year, mean, you I. Get... I remember one time, Lance. Uh, we had a flood in my house. There's uh, kind of broke the pipe broke, and we got home from a dinner, and the chandelier in the in the in the living room or dining room is falling fell on the table. And there's water. It's like a it's like a waterfall. Oh man! From the ceiling, so we had to leave leave our house and go in a hotel. But the Monday after, I my office was was still open. Well, my office was still there, and I, I was able to go work. So I went to my office, and they had the heaters in the house. And it was summertime in California. It must have been 120 degrees in my house, and. I had to sell pucks. I, I had to make money. It was my only living was the fly puck. That week, I kid you not, I think I sold for like $22,000 of pucks that week. Holy I cow. was selling I was selling at least 15, 20 stores a day. Or, I mean, I don't know, like 15, the, the, the pucks were $7. A case is 350, right? So 50 times 7 is 350. So ten case is three thousand. Uh, I sold for twenty thousand. So I sold uh, seven times. That sold like seventy cases of pucks that week. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember I was on the phone. I had the headset, and and in my office, I was able to type and find the phone number and the address. But if I got when I had somebody on the phone, I had to go to my bathroom because the fans <laughs> were so loud that I couldn't hear. <laughs> So I would go in the bathroom, and I couldn't even turn the light on because it was too dark in there. And the fan made noise too. So I had to go in the bathroom. It's 120. I'm I'm soaking wet, soaking wet. It's 120, but I got my cell. I sold the guy a case of puck, and guess what? <laughs> He's got five stores. So I sold him five cases. 
Uh, and, and that I would go back to my desk, like sweating like a pig, and put in my, you know, prepare my order. And we, I had a, I had a fulfillment center in Phoenix that would store the box for me. So I would send the orders to them, and then they would just ship it. So I didn't yeah. have to worry about the shipping. And this is yeah. all pre-internet sales. This is this you on oh, the yeah. phone grinding, yeah. Just the phone. Wow. All right. So <laughs> maybe we should get... do maybe we should do a part one and part two. <laughs> I know. I mean, it, there, there's the, when you look back on it, you know, when you really sit there and think, uh, you know, you you have a, it, there's some pretty cool stories. So let's transition yeah. now because. Um, I'm assuming that the the fly puck and one hockey were kind of evolving and going on at the same time. So for me, having two boys yep. playing, two boys that have uh, played hockey and are still playing, uh, the tournaments growing up that I'm familiar with is the uh, Fargo Squirt International Tournament. Uh, the... The one up in Winnipeg, the North American Classic, that's been around for a while, and that's a pretty big scale. Uh, the Brick Tournament yep. in Edmonton, and then the Quebec Pee Wee Major Pee Wee Tournament, uh, and then your mm-hmm. dad, uh, Ganton, and I apologize if I didn't say that correctly. He was the president of the Sherbrooke Bantam International Tournament. So um, mm-hmm. you were exposed to a lot of. Uh, high-end tournaments and what you're putting out there now is based on what you've seen in all of those tournaments and what you've learned and you're jacking it out of the park one weekend at a time yeah awesome talk to me yeah. about one hockey <laughs> thanks uh it's a good way to say it no a quick story a uh, really important story my dad my dad took over this tournament in Quebec in 1989. It was a Bantam tournament, so 14 years old. And there were no teams there anymore. And it was a city-owned tournament. My dad is an organizer. He's, 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 a, he's a public face. He's, he's a speaker. He's just a go-getter, like I am. I learned, learned that from him uh, 100%. Watching him do what he did, it was incredible. So he took this tournament with really no teams. Uh, first thing he said to the city, he says, I need some money to help these teams from Russia come here and play. And they said, why? You know, I said, well, we charge it at the door, right? We charge a gate to go watch the games. So they, they're going to fill the rink. They're the best teams in Russia. Well, why? Why? Now, stop asking me why and give me the money. Otherwise, I quit. You can do your own <laughs> tournament. So they gave him the money. He got it, gave it to his Russian friend, which probably kept the whole money. Uh, and then he got Moscow Dyna- Dynamo and, Mos- and, and Red, uh, the Red Army to come. Best oh, teams right. in Russia, probably best teams in the world. Yeah. Uh, and then they started beating up teams, like really good teams from Montreal and Toronto and Quebec. Uh, nothing. Uh, and all of a sudden, everybody is talking about these Russian teams. Three years later, he had 12 countries in his tournament. Uh Russian, Swedish, Czech, oh, they were all here, Finland. Uh, and then, all you know, Little Caesars, Honey Bake, teams from Michigan, Toronto, teams from Boston. Uh, so it was really a, a special tournament, uh, probably the best tournament uh, in the world, I, I'd say. And, you know, you had – the whole city was behind him. Uh, one year, I know you had over 250 volunteers to help run the tournament. So it was like a red carpet event, first class. You get to the rink, you get somebody's going outside to get you out of your bus and come on in. I'm I'm George and nice to meet you, Lance. And from Minnesota, hey, come on down. We got you some coffee here and your locker room's up here. Hey, your players can go there and get their gifts. And in the meantime, the TV's there doing interviews and the, the, the radio and the, you get to the ring and the organ is playing in between whistles. And they're, I mean, it's, it's a tournament, a real tournament. So when I start playing, I would go to tournaments. Went to Edmonton, uh, similar as Winnipeg. Went to Calgary, a Stampede, Toronto, and Colorado. And every time I was disappointed because they were not what I call a tournament. They were a, a place for two hockey. So 
after doing this for a few years, I got frustrated and I said, hey, dad, I need to start my own tournaments. Can you help me? So he helped me. Uh, he gave me all of his tricks and kind of got me started. So I got a brochure. I got a website. That's like 2003. Uh, and then I start inviting teams to come. And every team I talk to, they ask me, well, who was there last year? I said, nobody. It's the first <laughs> time. But my dad, you know, he did it. And nobody cared about my dad. They couldn't care less. So nobody wanted to sign up. And uh, so I went. I don't know how long I went. Uh, just didn't do nothing about it. Just thinking. And I was sad because I said, hey, I can't have my own tournaments. Nobody wants to play. Like, this is ridiculous. So I have to be able to do something. So, but before, or I was still doing hockey schools across the U.S. West Coast, Midwest, East Coast. So, so I had an idea. Like, I know a lot of people at, at the peewee level, like 11 years old, 12 years old. Maybe I could build my own teams. If they are my teams, they go where I say, and where I say is they go to my tournament. Is this the I free run the agent? show? Is this the free agent tournament yeah. concept that you came up with? Yeah. Uh, yes. Just leave the food there. Brilliant. Yeah. So, so this was not well. Yeah. So, I start. Uh, so I start calling people and I put together a little package. Say, okay, I can give the kids a jersey and. It's going to cost me this. I give him a hat and a T-shirt, and I got to pay the coaches and pay their hotel and their flight to get to Sherbrooke because it wasn't my hometown and my dad's rink that I did this first tournament. Uh, and then I start making calls, and, I, and I'd be like, hey, I'm, I, I'm going to put a team together in your area, like Chicago and St. Louis. They were together. and I, the, bird, the kids were born in 1992, and I still have friends from that team to this date that are really close friends of mine like players that were players then they were like and now we're friends they're 30 years older 34 uh and uh, i said hey we're gonna put a team together you want to play on my team this is one hockey midwest and then start making another call like hey we need another player can you bring one of your buddies call a friend and call another friend and next thing you know we're we have 12 guys and hey, we need two more guys and so we built i built a team player by player and so I had six teams go into Sherbrooke, my hometown. Plus, when I was in Burnsville, I met uh, uh, Zach, not Zach, Sh Schroeder. What's his Schroeder's name? Schrader? First name? Jordan? Schroeder. What's his first name, the player? Jordan? Jordan, yeah. I met his dad because his brother, Zach, came to uh, – it was in my hockey school. So I met his dad there. I had nine kids in my hockey school the first year. The second year, I had 35. First year, I had nine kids. So his dad says, what are you doing here with nine kids? I said, I don't. I mean, nobody knows me here, and I'm trying, but it's... I said, hey, listen, is your kid good? He said, yeah, he played for the Minnesota Blades. He's the, one of the best players in, in the city. I said, okay, I'll make a bet with you. But after the week is over, I'm his favorite coach. He says, it's impossible. He's got the best coach in town. So he comes to me on Friday, and he says... My, my kid loves you so much. I can't stand hearing your name anymore. Every night, Sebastian this, Sebastian that, Sebastian said this, said that. He's like, you want to come over from my, to my house tonight for dinner? I said, yeah. So I went to his house, and he ended up taking both Minnesota Blades team to my first tournament, which was huge. Yeah. Uh, one of them won. The, the 92 Virginia team, they won the tournament. And then he brought the 91 as well. This There's about... With these two on these two teams, uh, I would have to look at their names, but there's a good group, yeah. So now I have eight teams in the U.S. in my tournament, six are mine, two are the Blades, and I got two local teams to play, and I got two more from Montreal, so we had 12. So it was the first tournament, it was really well run. We did like opening ceremony, fireworks on the ice, and the, the press conference, the whole nine yard. Uh, a couple of years after, I moved it to Philadelphia. Because uh, it was easier in the U.S. Uh, Aston, Pennsylvania, they have four ice there. And the, the little flyers play out of there. And the guy that runs the rink, Stefan Charber, I know he's French. So we, you know, we kind of knew each other. So it, it was easy to make the transition there. And I just kept building those teams. I said, hey, if I have six teams with no tournament, I can keep building those teams. And so I would call coaches all over the U.S. and say, hey, why don't you take a couple teams from Michigan? I'll pay for your trip, give you a little money, 
the kids are gonna, you know, this is gonna what it's gonna cost them. The uniform is is supply. The, the you got practice the day before or two days before exhibition games. The hotel is taken care of. So I organized the whole trip, and uh, so I went from six teams, and the, two years later I had like or three years later I had like a hundred teams. Wow, it was nuts. It was yeah. crazy. <laughs> yeah. So so go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, you know, you're, you, it's just amazing how you just focus on the process. I mean, you, you must have had a phone on your ear, <laughs> you know, yeah. almost all the time. Because again, a lot of this, when you're just beginning was just when the internet was starting to get more mainstream. Uh, so a lot yeah. of it was, uh, now you've built it to where it's not just North America you know, you were getting teams coming over here, but now you branched off over in Europe, right? And did you get over to Asia yet? Yeah, we, uh, yeah, we last year we were going to do Sweden. Again, a kid that played in my tournament uh, with uh, with Johnny Goodrow's team back then, a 93 bird year. He came from Sweden. His dad took a team. The first the first year the kid was at his house last week in Sweden. He just came back yesterday. I just got back. Uh and uh, the, the first year we played on our one hockey team, the kid, his dad says, hey, if you want to go play in the U.S., uh, find a tournament. And so he found one hockey, and he, he emailed me. He says, I want to go play in your tournament. I'm from Sweden. I said, okay, come down. His dad came with him. They loved it. Then the next year he brought a team. He needed three or four players. It was in Philadelphia. So somehow they got a hold of Johnny Goodrow. Johnny Goodrow played for them with two or three guys. They were a really good team. Uh, and... Uh, so this guy now is my Swedish contact. So last year we we're going to do Sweden, uh, Russia, but would happen, you know, we you know what Russia would happen. Uh, yeah. And those two events were sold out. Uh, and then, so we had to stop because of COVID and then the worst, the Russian war, uh, the Russian guy was going to bring 15 Russian teams to my Omaha tournament, uh, a world event, like the Quebec peewee tournament type. Yeah. Uh, in Omaha, which we're moving into New Jersey next year over Christmas. But uh, they didn't come because of the war. And so now we're back in Sweden in April. And uh, we're two individual players. So April is 12 years old, 11, 13, 14. Uh, and we're inviting individual players if they want to play. Uh, they can apply online on onehockey.com and, and play. And we're forming our own teams. We have guys forming their own teams, which we're paying them to coach. So we're back to kind of almost back to what I started with uh, because it's because Europe is new and people don't know, you know, what's going to happen with these events and how they're going to be. So when they become, we'll just let, you know, we'll just let the teams come with coaches. We'll take teams and because it's a lot of work for us to form our own teams. Would rather yeah. focus on the event, yeah. uh, but we have forty-five tournaments a year now, all over. We're starting with, uh, Minnesota girls logo here. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, oh go. yeah! So this nice. this is our new girls uh, brand. Uh, but we got girls, we got boys, we got adults, uh, adults.onehockey.com. That's starting up too in really cool spot like Nashville, Florida, Palm Springs, Las Vegas. So we're, yeah, we, I love what, I love what I do. I have a really good, my staff is unbelievable, uh, which they allow me to grow the business and, and focus on the growth and they can focus on the day to day and customer service and emails and phone calls. So we're, you know, we're, we're doing well and it, it, our tournaments are fun. Like it's just, it's all about the kids. It's when my dad is focused on the kids, the kids. So we have a mascot here this weekend. We have player interviews, player the games, music in between plays, music in between games, MVP, champagne, you know, non-alcoholic champagne for the, the celebration on the ice on the eye and like we really go all out and and the kids leave this tournament and they'll never forget it ever yeah. and they want to they want to come back and they're like hey, when we go back to one hockey this is the most fun tournament i've ever been yeah. and so 
we grow with the kids and of course, making decisions. So we have really good uh, coach coaches contacts that we see all the time in our tournaments, and we just don't have any kids. So for me, these kids that are playing in my tournament are my kids, and my only goal is to have them leave with a smile on their face. If I can do that, I've done my job, and everything else will come. You're a good man, my friend. That's awesome. Um, so I read when I was researching this, uh, reading some articles on you. So apparently that the Guinness Book of World Records was uh, <laughs> going to be hosting the largest hockey tournament in the world that you were going to. Uh, the previous record was held back yeah. in 2007, uh, January 5th through the 13th yeah. in Calgary, Alberta. And that tournament featured 664 teams of 10,992 players competing in 957 games on 42 sheets of ice. Did you shatter that record? Uh, well, I had it. I had it. I had it shattered for sure. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story because I could. I could do a movie with with stuff I've done and then. Shipment come in from China and stuck at the border and like I, you, I have stories, stories and stories. Uh, but this one is a good one. I woke up one night and I had this. I woke up with this vision of beating a Guinness record, biggest swimmer <laughs> in the world. And I even had the, the, the divisions marked down. Like everything was just very clear. Twelve teams per rink, and all we need is one ice per division. And then I look up the next day, the tournament was in Calgary. It was I said, well, we can do bigger than that. So I started building the divisions, and we had like 22 divisions per age. So we had 56 divisions. So I rented 56 ice surfaces. Michigan Hockey was on board. They were supporting us. Needs to help youth hockey in Michigan. And, and, and everybody I called uh, or – our staff, you know, not just myself, but my, my guys, everybody we called was in. They were coming to the tournament with all their teams. Like It was like 10 teams, 15 teams, 20 teams. So next thing you know, we have a list of 800. It's crazy. Uh, and then we start asking these teams to sign up and, and go put a deposit that Christmas. So it was December 26th to 30th, I think. Uh, now we started getting the, uh, you know, my parents, like I have two parents that are going on a trip to Hawaii and these guys are going to Hong Kong for a week. And these guys are, so everybody had excuses and all of a sudden we were starting. So we went from 800 teams to, to 40 teams. It was, it was just unbelievable. Uh, but it was a, it was a really good experience, a learning experience, I guess it was a, really fun ride and we'll do it we'll do it again one day uh that's I... that's that's like six years ago six years ago we were not i don't think we were known enough to do this but now we're getting really well known and next time we put on that guinness tournament uh, i think we'll do it in michigan again because that was the right place to do it uh i think next time will be a go and we'll be in the world guinness uh, book that uh, that time well let me know because if you're going to pull it off I want to be there because I've never been a part of a Guinness record. So that'd be kind of cool. <laughs> uh, oh, you'll know. Definitely. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. I got uh, one one or two more questions, but you've been an entrepreneur since retiring from playing. What's the one trait, characteristic, habit, or skill you're grateful for having acquired the discipline? Uh, so I, you asking me what's my what's what's my greatest uh, 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 skill or or what do I do best? I, I I didn't understand your question. It's you know what what habit or skill or trait did you acquire over time that you're grateful that you did? You know, like for me, it it's I'm grateful that I'm able to. Um, focus my attention 
on one thing for as long as I want. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. I don't know yeah, about yeah. you. Okay. I got it. Yeah. So, well, what I've learned over the years really, uh, there's a few things. There's one thing that I, that I've always kind of had, and I think it's, it's really important for any business person or anybody that wants to run a business because not everybody is an entrepreneur. Uh, the people work, you know, nine to five and they're fine with that. And then, then that's, that's how they are. But you know, when you, when you work in the business world and you want to have your own business, uh, sometimes you work, uh, you know, 80 hours a week, right? So you never know. Uh, but I don't, you know, the, the no's that I get when somebody tells me no, it, it just motivates me to get the yes. It doesn't stop me. It doesn't, I, you know, I, I would tell the person, I'd say, hey, listen, you know, you're making a mistake by telling me no. And that's okay. And you don't know yet, but you're making a mistake. Man, you'll, you'll call me back in two years and you're going to want to come in that event. But it'll be impossible to get in. But I'm giving you an opportunity now to do it. And, and that's more for a world, a world event that we're doing now in New Jersey. So that's OneHockeyWorld.com. Uh, those events now are going to have teams from all over the world. And the, you know, teams like Chicago Mission and really, really strong programs. Uh, so I don't take no's. But also now, uh, over the years, I used to do everything myself. And, and I've learned that what I had before hockey was a job for me. Now, now I have a business. Uh, it's not a perfect business, but it's a business. Meaning that if I'm gone for a month and I don't look at my emails or my phones, well, I have people that can take care of that. And uh, yes, they might need me one day because there's, there's an urgency or something. Is but they they know what to do. So that means that I built a business. Uh, in fact, I read a, a book, and I encourage anybody that's in business world to read this book. It's called "Build a Business, Not a Job." You can probably find it on online anywhere. Build sure. a business, not a job. Read this. It's going to make you think because uh, as a friend of mine told me to read the book because I was telling him that I'm going to be able to kind of move away from one hockey in a couple of years and just it's going to run by itself. And he, he said to me, he says, no, 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 no. I don't want to ruin your party there, but uh, you need to understand. Uh, so that really changed my, my, my view on things uh, and it really helped me focus on the business and not, not just the job. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So you, you, you have a number of websites that you've um, places where people can find you uh, for, for different adult kid uh, parent uh, rattle them off here for me. I'm going to put them in the, the description uh, for, for this okay. episode, but just uh, throw them out there for everyone to listen if they want to quickly jot down. Yeah. Yeah, so for the for the hockey tournaments, uh, onehockey.com, that's their that's their oldest website. For the girls hockey tournaments, uh, girls.onehockey.com, adult tournaments, adults.onehockey.com. And for a world invitational, which is going to become something very special, it's very high level, triple elite level in New Jersey's Christmas time. We already have teams from Sweden, teams from Czech Republic. Germany, so they're coming, uh, and then uh, we're just going to fill up with North American teams. That 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 is uh, onehockeyworld.com. So there's a few different ones. Perfect. I'll uh, I'll get them all sorted out and put it into a tidy little uh, package. So thank you for being a guest on the show, Sebastian. I I really enjoyed hearing you know the after a couple layers of the onion were peeled back. Uh, congrats on a, a career that not many players ever get to have. And thank you for cultivating your passion for your baby, which is one hockey. Uh, it's just making memories one game and one tournament at a time, my friend. So continued success. And if there's anything that I can do to help you, uh, fan that passion flame and increase memories for kids let me know i appreciate it for being for you being here wow, thanks a lot. Awesome. thank you uh, it's great to re, uh, reconnect if you're in blaine this weekend or around stop by we're going to be here all weekend 
and uh, congrats on your son as well. I know he's playing, he's doing great, and he's, he's following his dream, so that's great to see. Well, thank you very much. And uh, again, great stories, uh, great life, and can, just thanks for making hockey a better game and, and what you do for others. Uh, have a great weekend, Sebastian. All right, thank you. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey Podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed the Sebastian Fortier One Hockey Hockey Journey. He had a vision, went after it, and hasn't stopped. Pretty cool. If you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon and... Do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.